Welcome to the Psychology World Podcast with me, Conor Whiteley, psychology student and international best-selling psychology author of over 30 psychology books, bringing you the latest psychology news, fascinating psychology topics and more each week. If you want to learn more, then please check out conorwhiteley.net forward slash books. And don't forget to like and subscribe to the YouTube video or follow on your favourite podcast app. And here's the show. Hi everyone and welcome to episode 255 of the Psychology World Podcast with me, Connor Whiteley. And today's episode is on how to be a trauma-informed partner. It is Sunday the 3rd of March 2023 as I record this. So today's episode I'm actually quite looking forward to because this is a really fun topic, it's very timely and I think this is just such a topic that is not talked about enough. I think this is so important, especially within modern clinical psychology because modern clinical psychology is definitely moving towards being more trauma in a form and better understanding trauma. And because we've been focusing a lot about psychotherapies lately, I've been still wanting to do clinical psychology. Of course, that's my area that I love, but I've been wanting to take a different approach to it. So relationships and social psychology is definitely something that I wanted to look at. So when we combine these really interesting topics together, we get something that is absolutely amazing. And I love today's episode. I think it's so useful. And yeah, this is just a topic I really am looking forward to talking about. And I do get quite personal in it, but that just helps it to come alive and make it even more interesting. So you've got that to look forward to in the content part of today's episode. So moving on to the psychology news section, we're reading from the British Psychological Society Research Digest. And the first one is, does your partner annoy you? So very apt for today's episode. As everyone who's ever been in a relationship knows, it's not exactly fair to feel irritated with your partner. One informal survey of 2,000 adults in the UK even found that a third considered their partner to be the most annoying person they know. Fortunately, psychologists have done plenty of research to help us understand this common phenomenon. Often insights on both the most common causes of everyday irritation and how to manage these feelings for both your sakes. And then if you head on over to the BPS like website and then you can see the write up. But I think that to be honest, I like, um doing any sort of like relationship topic on the psychology news section is actually quite pointless to be honest for me personally because I've never been anyone, so I've never got any experience to actually draw from. But I think, to be honest, like, friendships, romantic relationships, they're all still for um, relationships, so we can still draw on them. And I think certain close relationships, they can sort of be the next step down from romantic relationships. Yes, I am just trying to find something useful to say here. And yeah, I mean, like, really close friends, they can be annoying at times, like, I love my friends, but, I mean, like, they're just annoying at times, and, like, it's sometimes just, like, like, the little stuff, for example, like, um, for example, like, some odd habits, or how they say, like, something, so, yes, um, I think that this is very, very common, but I think this only becomes a problem if we don't deal with it, if we don't manage these feelings, which is why knowing how to deal with these feelings whenever they pop up is really important. And also, I mean, like, just talk to the person. If something's really irritating you and you want it to change, then they're not going to change it or they're not going to know they need to change it unless you talk to them. So I've always been a massive fan of just open conversations, just open dialogue, which is something else we talk about in today's episode. So the second one is, masking up, beyond legal requirements. 
After the outbreak of COVID-19 pandemic in 2020, the government brought in legal requirements to wear masks in public spaces in order to minimise the spread of the virus. In England, masks were required on, on public transport and in shops and restaurants from June 2020 to July 2021, then reinstated in November 2021 after the rise of the Omicron variant. All such requirements were lifted in January 2022. Research looking at masking behaviour during this period has identified several factors linked to a adherence to mask mandates. However, it's been less clear which factors encourage people to protect themselves and others from infection by continuing to use, to use masks when there is no legal requirement to do so. This is the focus of a new paper in the British Journal of Health Psychology in which Lucy Smith and her colleagues explored the continued mask usage and provide useful inner insights into how to promote protective health behaviours beyond legal requirements. And I uh, just had a little uh, flick through the BPS right up uh, and some of the uh, factors were about the acknowledgement of the risks that the um, virus like poses, uh, but also the like effectiveness of of, of the, like, masks that were so uh, Okay. So, what those two factors help people to like understand and and to hear to mask like are wearing. But I think this is quite an interesting topic because I've seen since January 2022, I've not worn a mask. In fact, I think the vast majority of people haven't because I think that we all we all acknowledge that COVID hasn't gone away. But it's no longer a major public health risk like it was before. Like it's still quite dangerous, and like, I still know people who have caught COVID. Thankfully, they've not died from it because they've been like like vaccinated. But I think it's interesting that um, once the legal mandates go, unless this becomes a really ingrained part of our behaviour, we just don't do it. So I think that for future pandemics. I think this research is going to be invaluable and a massive thank you to all the researchers that have done this sort of research. But I think from a societal point of view, I think it's quite interesting to think about why don't we continue public health behaviours when we know they work after legal mandates have been lifted. So it's interesting. And it's definitely worth thinking about for the sake of the future. And the final one is exploring the use of mental health labels on campus. Much has been said about mental health terminology and diagnostic labels having come part of the cultural landscape as Neil Armstrong and colleagues at King's College London and University of Oxford put it. The new paper adds nuance to the conversation and offers an exploration of how and why students use mental health labels in the context of university. In it, the team shows that the use of mental health labels can be flexible, fluid and contextual and serve a practical role as campus technologies. Reports provided by students paint a picture of complex, slippery, shifting use of diagnostic terminology which often proves so useful in a way we might automatically not expect. And then there's a massive bias at the, at the BPS Research Digest website. So the reason why I chose this one and not the one before it in the email to wrap up with is because like I've definitely spoken before about how, to be honest, no one in clinical psychology likes the DSM. The diagnostic manual is rubbish it's quite useless and it's just it's so biomedical model i mean it's so last century too to the which is why on the podcast before i've also covered about new alternatives to the dsm in uh, in including the high top model but also form you know which is where clinical psychology is uh, thankfully going more and more each year so i think the idea that uh, um labels are useful or just 
quite like useless and I've spoken about this quite a lot in my clinical psychology reflective books. But I do understand the so-called benefits to them in their terms like funding, signposting and accessing support. But in terms of university, I think this is largely true because you can't get an inclusive learning plan, at least that's what they're called in my university, like extra time and different um, accommodations made to you if you don't have a, di a diagnostic label which I hate beyond all else or else. So thankfully my university is changing that and um, I've been encouraged to get one but I'm like I don't struggle academically it's everything else socially that I struggle with. <laughs> so I definitely think that there are arguments for diagnostic labels and I think that they can be useful in the sense that certain labels are more useful than others because some are less stigmatised like than others because in my echo experience and from the clinical psychologist that I've spoken to it's definitely the neurodevelopmental disorder labels which can give people a sense of relief and sort of like um, not so much an indication but, but parents and children tend to feel quite relieved when they actually receive an autism diagnosis because there's like finally this answer to why their child is acting like that particular way. So some labels are quite beneficial but then there are other labels that I've seen firsthand which can be quite damaging. For example, calling someone depressed um, in my experience and in my social world, people tend to call that person lazy, um, miserable and just quite un unlike helpful terms. So it's definitely quite a nuanced picture. I do quite like this argument and this debate about the diagnostic labels. So it's now quite useful to know that there can be nuance to this debate because at universities they can be quite useful at least to some I guess, sense, so it's interesting. And if this is a topic that interests you, definitely read the article at the Research Digest website. So I hope you enjoyed the psychology news section. So let's move on to the personal update. So moving on to the personal update. So whilst there's not a lot to actually be a port this week, there are definitely two things that I want to talk about in a moment. But I think this is going like really well. I've been doing a lot of like um, outreach work for my university. So we're going back into my older school, seeing some of my own teachers, which is always weird, but it's always fun. But and uh, quite a lot of um, quite exciting opportunities are like are popping up. And for my health share in like September, um, the attendance ag agreements we're finally signing. So hopefully that should be wrapped up by Thursday. Well, not hopefully, it sort of has to be, otherwise we lose the house. <laughs> so hopefully the others sign those documents as soon as possible. Anyway though, so the two things I want to talk about, one of them is actually quite like funny though. So yesterday I was um, working a university applicant day. So applicants to the, um, to the School of Psychology at my university they come in, they talk, they get to talk to us, they get tours and everything though. So the vast majority of the, you know, like applicant days are basically just to sell the university and make my university their first choice for psychology. But interestingly, so I always try and like work these events because they're good paying. So like, I quite like it. You basically get paid for standing around five hours just talking you mainly just uh, talk to the psychology staff, for, but you also talk to uh, students. So I was talking like to them, and um, and there's always someone from like clinical um, psychology. Normally, it's the head of the clinical program, so I talk to him like a fair bit because we know like each other. But this time, it was um, Dr. Claire Vass, who's this brilliant lecturer at my university. Now, I'm not the sort of person to have a fan person moment. I'm not the sort of person to get so excited about seeing like someone and just acting like a complete fan. 
whatsoever but when she came down to our stool I did a like a double take and then in the side of my head I was sort of like oh right it's you oh my god like you're here here though and the reason why I was like that and I was acting like quite a like a fan person thankfully no one noticed which I'm so happy about because I, that would have been so embarrassing considering I have lectures with this woman like next year though well but the reason why I'm a massive fan of her as a lecturer is because she's so down to earth but also because she's very social constructionist she's very funny and she does not like the biomedical model I mean she I mean like if any of you think I'm passionate about it she's even more passionate she hates the biomedical model with an utter passion passion that well but that's what i really like about it i'm definitely thinking about asking her to come on the podcast at some point because mainly just so i can talk to her for like half an hour because that would be absolutely like a brilliant i thought that was just quite funny because i never get like that I never act like um, a fan person. I never get so excited about seeing a like a lecturer. Normally, I tend to avoid like lecturers because um, some of them are just really hard to talk to. <laughs> but something else that I thought was actually quite interesting is at my university, we currently don't have a psychology society. And for our international audience, what that means is that so in our VK you've got societies which are adult social clubs which are formed around particular interests. Every single academic subject should have a society but psychology doesn't because there's no committee and the school of psychology we were talking to the head of school yesterday and he was quite adamant that he wants to restart it because it is a massive shame that we don't have a psychology society so me and the girls so that i was talking to we were thinking about it and i said well maybe i should start the psychology society back up next year and then we were all talking about it and to be honest i really do want to become president of the psychology society just because it would give me one something else to do like i actually need anything else but it would just be a great way to actually meet psychology students and actually organise events and most importantly get to learn about research and just talk to people. So I think it would be quite interesting. So um yeah, so that's something that might be happening in the future. To be honest, I doubt it will, but it would be really, really nice and quite interesting. So there were lots of exciting things happening in the future, hopefully. And as always, I always love to hear your thoughts and feelings on today's episode. So you can always email me, conwiley, conwiley.net. You can always leave a comment on the show notes at conwiley.net forward slash podcast. And you can always tweet me on Twitter at sci-fi whitely. I always love to hear from all of you because it really helps make the podcast feel more like a conversation. Or you can leave a comment on the uh, Facebook post at Connor Whiteley, psychology author. So today's episode has not been sponsored by Psychology of Relationships, the Social Psychology of Friendships, Romantic Relationships and more, because I wanted to change our things up for a, a while, but better that books are available in all the usual places too. In a stead, I wanted this podcast episode to uh, be sponsored by Working Not With the Children and Younger People, a guide to clinical psychology, mental health and psychotherapy. So the reason why this book is actually a really good sponsor for today's episode is because this episode focuses on trauma, mental health, helping to rebuild a confidence and basically just like um, general mental health stuff which this book actually helps with quite a bit because when we work with children and younger people they have their very specific needs, needs and they have their own mental health services at least in the UK, and that requires a somewhat specialist knowledge because you will need to understand and how these services are different to adult mental health services. So this great, really easy to understand book helps you to understand that at quite a like deep level. But then um, it also deals with quite a lot of like other stuff because 
It's not only clinical psychology, it's to, to help with children and the young people. It's actually an entire range of uh, mental health uh, professionals. And when you see the list, it's actually quite impressive. And that you actually realise how many different options that there are that you could possibly do but with your psychology degree within mental health. Slightly outside of clinical psychology, but still drawing a lot on it. So that I found absolutely like fascinating. And then we also talk about paediatric psychology, which is a lot more interesting than I ever thought possible. And this is just such a good, really quite in-depth book that really does help you to un understand at a deep level how does a clinical psychology help children and adolescents. So I really do recommend it. So that is Working with Children and Younger People, a guide to clinical psychology, mental health and psychotherapy. Available at all major ebook retailers and you can get the paperback and hardback version from Amazon your local bookstore or local library if you request it and you can also get the audiobook narrated by artificial intelligence at selected audiobook retailers like Kobo, Barnes & Noble, Google Play and selected library systems if you request it. So whilst buying books helps to support the creation and the editing of the podcast my time is sponsored by my wonderful patrons and as always, a massive thank you to my patrons, because your support shows that you like the show and that you want it to continue. So if you wanted to become a patron and get access to some of the great rewards, now you can at patreon.com forward slash the psychology world podcast. So that's enough for the personal update, let's move on to the content part of today's episode. So in today's episode, we're going to be talking about how to be a trauma-informed partner. And this is a podcast episode I really am looking forward to. It's going to be great, interesting, and just absolutely perfect if you want to work in a clinical psychology in the future. And I think even if you don't, this is still such a useful episode that you're going to learn from for your own um, sake. And before we get into today's episode, I just want to stress... That, as always, absolutely nothing on this podcast whatsoever is any sort of official medical relationship, career, or any form of official advice. It is not advice. So, let's dive into it. Why do we need to learn about trauma-informed approaches? Personally, I think there are three main reasons why it is critical to understand trauma-informed approaches. Firstly, this is a psychology podcast that aims at providing psychology students, professionals and other people with psychological knowledge and we mainly focus on clinical psychology because this is my main interest. Therefore, trauma-informed in approaches are becoming more and more recognised and valued within clinical psychology so you need to learn about them. In fact, if you're in the UK, then you will probably be asked about trauma-informed approaches when you go, if you're in it, to the, to, work, to work it onto the Declan Psych, which is the Doctor of a Clinical Psychology course, for anyone that doesn't know. And you don't want to risk not knowing about an important area that might pop up. Secondly, humans, like you and me, I'd like to be quite scared if there wasn't a, a human listening to this. <laughs> we are social creatures. We all like social relationships. And these include romantic ones. Therefore, there is a, a good chance that at one point in our lives we will date and maybe even fall in love with a person who has experienced trauma. These relationships will have unique challenges out of no fault of either party. But how these challenges are dealt with might become problems in their own right. Therefore, in this podcast episode, I want to give you the knowledge so that you know how you might want to navigate these challenges and make your partner feel safe. Finally, I just think that this is a great topic and personally, I am fascinated by the concept of trauma-informed approaches because of my own abuse and trauma. 
I seriously want to un understand this a bit, and maybe I'll find some extra healing or relaxation. You could tell I was struggling to find my words there. <laughs> In this knowledge. I don't know to be honest, but that's what I'm here learning and having fun along the way. Also, I should note that the main points of this episode came from the, the University of Kent's Student Support Services Instagram page from a post that they did on the 16th of February 2024. So that's the reference for today's episode too. Understand what your partner needs. At first, this might seem like a very simple and almost silly point to make. Due to, I can imagine a lot of people just dismissing this idea because surely we all know what our, what our partner needs. They only need a bit of love, support and uh, some fun and then they'll be happy. Surely it's as simple as that. Maybe in other relationships that don't involve trauma, but even then I highly doubt it. Like We know that there's a lot more to relationships than that. Since when it comes to trauma and life in general, we need to remember that everyone has had different experiences with intimacy, sex and sexual relationships. Some people might have had brilliant relationships and they have no uh, relationship issues or baggage. And they're the lucky people, I think. <laughs> Yet other people might have been abused, assaulted or hit in the past relationships. So but this can bring up complications into the current relationships. As a result, it is critical that you try to understand your partner's experiences to find out what they were, how positive or negative they were. And if they were negative, then you need to approach this relationship with a trauma in a, in a formed manner or mindset. Personally, drawing on my own experiences here, Whilst I've never been in a relationship, more than enough mental health and trauma stuff has popped into closer friendships for me to understand, even roughly, how I would react in a romantic relationship. And yes, I mean, like, those conversations are always quite fun to have. And it's good that everything I do, and all of my reactions, I can trace back to a particular event, so now it's just about overcoming them. Yet in a relationship, I have been in a partner who was willing to be patient, supportive and listen to my experiences. Communication is key in relationships. Of course, this is a brilliant rule for life because honest conversations are extremely powerful, but not everyone is ready to share things in a relationship. One example I can uh, I can think of is that it took me almost two months to tell my closest friend about my past, how traumatised I was and everything that's happened to me at times because I was so scared of losing them because of it. That happened before and then it took me another two months to kill that fear outright and now I'm a lot more open like with them but the joke still is is that i'm really closed off with them and to be honest uh, yeah that yeah that joke still holds some truth like to it though so that's just an example of how people aren't, aren't always willing to open up about trauma how it affects them and how all types of relationships can be difficult Therefore, when it comes to relationships, it's important that you try to create and encourage a safe emotional and physical space where your partner and yourself are both comfortable enough to share things openly. Understand trauma. Given how I sometimes feel that lay people use trauma as a buzzword, but absolutely no understanding of what trauma actually is, I can understand how some people in relationships might not understand the role of a trauma and how it affects people. Yet, if you truly care or even love your partner, then you need to un understand what trauma actually is. Since a trauma affects a person physically, emotionally and psychologically, no part of a person's life escapes trauma completely. When it comes to their physical body, your partner's nervous system will be affected by the trauma. 
for example, my heart rate. <laughs> this is bad. So my heart rate can have extreme reactions in certain situations because of my trauma and of what people have done to me before. Like two Saturdays ago, at the time of writing, my friend started to text me in a stranger way. All it was was they text me saying, hey, hey. And they never text me, to be honest. I always text them first. And um, and to be honest, even when they do text me, they just don't start conversations with that. Because it turned out that they wanted to ask me something quite massive. But considering I, uh, I had made a very innocent mistake a few days before, that honestly turned out to be nothing. My heart rate was apparent in because my trauma made me believe my really, really close friend was going to end the friendship with me. Of course, that didn't happen, like, thankfully, but it still took me another five minutes to break my heart rate back to normal. Only I've been caused by a friend texting me. I mean, that is an extreme reaction. As a result, I wanted to highlight how a trauma can make a partners react in ways that aren't always in their, in their control, and most of it is just automatic. But these responses aren't done on a purpose, and the partner isn't trying to hurt you. This is just how trauma has affected them. Then over time, hopefully, as you both work on helping each other, and uh, your partner tries to improve their own life and deal with the past, their responses will decrease and maybe stop entirely. Be observant in relationships. There are a lot of uh, different ways that this uh, point can be applied to relationships, but let's take the most innocent and probably most uh, common one. So you and your partner have just had a great night out, you've had a lot of fun, you've laughed a lot, then you start acting a bit flirty and you press them a little to come back to your place for a nightcap, and <laughs> which I always find quite a funny turn of phrase. And even if you seriously mean it as a nightcap, and no adult fun whatsoever, because this is going to show how little experience I actually have for river dating. I think a nightcap is literally you go back for some alcohol. I'm probably wrong and I'm probably sure some people are laughing <laughs> right now, but I think that's what a nightcap means. I know it normally means um, some more adult stuff too, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> anyway, though, so go like, back to it. So what's your partner's body language? It might change to a show they're uncomfortable, but they're too nervous or unsure about how you'll react if they say anything. If their body language changes, then just take a step back, relax, and act if their feelings escalate, since not everyone that communicates verbally all of the time. For example, when a friend of mine stayed over a few, like, a month ago, I could tell they were uncomfortable and slightly bored whilst they were talking to my parents, <laughs> and then later on they told me that they were anxious and uh, nervous, and that they only did it for my benefits. Now, I know this was just a, a, a friendship example, but the same could apply in, um, in a relationship. Since if this was a relationship, then I should have asked, um, asked uh, my friend what was wrong, and if everything was okay then that would have been better than noticing it and not recognising it for whatever it might have been. In this case, it was just anxiety, which for this particular friend does go back to some trauma. Just be open. So as we slowly take some steps towards dealing with more adult activities in relationships, it's important to know about that you need to have open conversations since people who have egg experienced trauma can have a difficult relationships with sex and a similar stuff. That's why it's important to talk to your partner about both of your likes, dislikes, and just talk about sex beforehand. You will need to make them feel comfortable and what they need from you if they get overwhelmed. Personally, and whether I should admit this on the podcast is probably up for debate but one of the benefits of being all artistic you don't necessarily like have a filter 
So personally, I am flat out terrified of the sex. I will happily admit that, and I have no doubt it will cause me massive issues in the future. And I mean massive issues. <laughs> but my fear comes from the touch difficulties from autism, but 90% of it is trauma related. Because without saying too much, even though I've probably already said this on the podcast before, um, I'm scared to let people close enough to touch me when they could hurt me. And logically, this is quite a silly fear. But from a trauma perspective, it's really practical and it's understandable. And I don't judge myself too harshly for having that um, fear. Which is why there are only 34 people I've met in my 22 years of being alive that I wouldn't think twice about having a sex with. Simply because I know these are four people would never hurt me. None of those things have ever happened though. Anyway, it just goes to a show with that how trauma can seriously affect sexual relationships and why it's important to be honest and open in conversations. Due to, I know when I eventually, <laughs> like, find someone, and I mean, like, that eventually might as well be in capital both like, letters, um, I won't be comfortable with the idea of a sex until a deep conversation is had about it. As that is another test to see if they care about me very much. As if they don't want the conversation, they clearly don't care that much about me. At least that's my perspective. Checking up with your partner during sex. I fully admit that I've never spoken about or said the word sex so many times in a conversation. And uh, you realise how uncomfortable you are with the idea when you struggle saying and writing it quite a lot. Like, um, I'm sure if I actually analysed um, when I was saying like that particular word, I'm pretty sure that it gets a lot quieter. <laughs> So I suppose that's why I write sweet romance, in that sort of steamy romance. I can't even imagine ever writing like um, steamy romance books. Anyway, building upon the last section, when you and your partner finally decide to have sex, and it's perfectly okay if this doesn't happen for a while, be it weeks, months or even years, it's important to check in with them during sex to see if they're okay. You can do this by occasionally asking your partner to see if what you're doing is okay and if they're enjoying it. Also, but you can remind them that you can stop at any time and they can withdraw consent whenever they want. As well as that you can agree on a safe word or another way of that communication that means that this needs to stop immediately. This is just flat out critical, I think. In making anyone who's been through trauma feel safe, secured, and cared for. Learn grounding techniques. Finally, if your partner starts out reacting or panicking or having some sort of negative reaction during sex, then help them. Like, seriously, just help them. One of the forms of this help I could have could be by encouraging them to use grounding techniques so, so they can become grounded in the present moment and not their traumatic past. These grounding techniques can include the assuring them that they're safe, referencing the present location, date and time, and other immediate sensations like oh, whatever you hear or whatever you see. This is all about helping to ground them in the present moment and making it harder for them to focus on the past and traumatic event that they're re-experiencing. Conclusion So at the end of the day, when it comes to being a, tra- a trauma-informed partner, it's about realising none of us can remove all the harm that trauma has caused our partner. It simply cannot be done. Yet, what can be done is that you can understand and support your partner by being patient and supportive and then you can do your best to minimise the harm caused by their trauma. This isn't going to be easy and I have had friends that have found dealing with my trauma difficult to say the least. So I, okay, 
So I have no idea how a future boyfriend or, or partner would find it. Yet I know that if they care about me or even love me, then they will be patient, understanding and supportive. That's what you need to do if you want to be a trauma-informed partner. Therefore, just as a reminder, here are the ways that you can be trauma in a form. Know what your partner needs. Communicate with them. Be observant. Understand trauma. Talk openly about adult activities. Check in with your partner during sex. Use um, grounding techniques. Just because a partner has a trauma in another part, it doesn't mean that they can never be loved. A relationship with a traumatised person can still be as magical, wonderful and loving as a relationship with anyone else. But only if you both have put the work in and you have become a trauma-informed partner that love, supports and understands your partner. So I really hope that you enjoyed today's episode and you got something out of it. I know that I did. I love episodes like this because I do love a trauma. I think it's quite a fun topic. <laughs> or no, maybe not fun, just maybe just ridiculously relatable. And it's just like, I think it's just useful to know like this stuff though. So I'm always uh, going to try and like do it from time to time. And this was a fun one because it's true. And it really got me to think about what I want in future relationships. So, it's always interesting. And if you know anyone who would like today's episode, then please share it with them. I'm always really grateful when you want to people help spread the word about the podcast. And if you want to know more, then please check out Working With Children and Younger People, available in all the usual places. And if you want to become a patron and get access to tons of great rewards, now you can at patreon.com forward slash the psychology world podcast so have a great day everyone and i'll see you next time thanks for listening today i hope you found it helpful please have remember to like the video and subscribe to the, the youtube channel and follow the podcast on your favorite podcast app and if you wanted to learn more, then please check out the backlist of the podcast episodes or my books at conwhitely.net. So have a great day and I'll see you next time.